Well, um, today we're going to talk about uh, food sovereignty. This is uh, an ongoing topic that we will cover for half the session for la starting last week and for the next few weeks. Um, I did just get your homework posted and your recording from last week and from July 5th. So a few of you were looking for that. So it's up there now. Um, <clears throat> so uh, today's session is gonna be in two parts. We're gonna spend the first half hour talking about food sovereignty, uh, specifically indigenous food sovereignty. And um, uh, Clara is, assuming she arrives, uh, is going to talk about her work, uh, her volunteerism with the Line 3 water protector movement, um, uh, trying to protect the treaty rights of the tribes in northern Minnesota um, from the Line 3 uh, pipeline that is slated to be built. And then we're going to hear from uh, Alyssa Joan Sullivan, who was an intern at Family Roots Farm last summer and has now started her own farm, Exit 44 Flowers and More. And her business partner, uh, Chris, who is uh, working with her. Hi, Clara. Um, so you haven't missed anything yet, Clara. We were, we were stall, I was stalling. <laughs> um, because um, I wanted to start, so we always start out with a reflection question to get us in the mood for discussion and conversation. And since we are talking about um, food ways and how the treaty rights are tied in with the food culture of the tribes in Northern Minnesota, I wanted to start out by thinking about what are some of the food cultures that we come from? what are some food traditions or dishes that are part of your family's traditions? Maybe a holiday dish or something that's part of your heritage. And um, for example, uh, I grew up in central North Dakota. I, my family is Germans from Russia or German Russian. So my grandma made lots of the traditional like nefla, and kuchen and the um, you know sauerkraut and sausage and dumplings dishes that the German that are part of the German from Russia tradition. But we also, you know, my mom and my grandma's also planted big gardens, so that's part of our my my culture too is is growing and preserving food. Um, Should I call, yeah, it works best, best when I call it people. Uh, Claire, I'll let you start the, the conversation. Sure. Um, I also grew up Central North Dakota, so culturally German from Russia, but there's like a whole loo of adoption. So genetically not, like my ancestors don't come from there, but um, that was a big part of my mom's side of the family. On my dad's side, we are very Norwegian and I was able to spend a semester abroad there. So I lived right on the coast. And so they have a lot of seafood there and there's a huge seafood market and ate so much salmon and gardening was really important there too. And foraging was also, they did a lot of berry picking in Norway. Oh, wonderful. Uh, I wanna go off on a tangent about Scandinavian berries, but I won't. Um, Natalie. Yeah, so my mom is Ukrainian, so we have a lot of Ukrainian fruits like sausage, pierogies, all those kind of things. And then my dad is African American, so his kind of cultural food, I guess, is often barbecue, um, especially collard greens, which was definitely an acquired taste for me. But now that I'm older, I like them. But when I was younger, I did not. For sure. How about you, Josh? Well, my family didn't or celebrate too many of our past cultures, mainly because my mom's allergies. So we had to watch a lot of what we were eating, no pork, 
a few citrus fruits, uh, low sodium. So we had to focus a lot more on um, finding the best types of foods that we could still eat as a family. But we are partly Jewish, so we would have Passover meals. We would have Hanukkah. So yeah. a lot more potato dishes. Um, how about you, Devin? I am genetically Dutch, but I'm not sure what foods I really, I don't know how many foods from that heritage that we've been, we've eaten. I mean, yeah, I'm really not sure, but uh, I know certain things like cinnamon rolls mom knew. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, I, I guess I'm also technically American, which in and in of itself has its own special cultural meals like um, Thanksgiving and that those sort of meals. Okay. And um, I, I've seen uh, your family's uh, farm's Facebook page and uh, you've been doing some gluten-free, sugar-free baking and there was some krumkaka there which yep. is Norwegian. Yeah, I believe that's Norwegian. We've been, uh, mom recently worked with uh, someone who uh, was Norwegian and we learned that from them. Wonderful. How about you, Gretchen? Um, I'm not very close to my extended family. They live all of them about like seven hours away. So we don't have a lot of shared um, food time, I guess. Uh, but kind of a big thing in my family is we're mostly like Norwegian, your kind of standard Midwestern blend. Um, but a lot of what we do is just homemade foods. Mm -hmm. So there's not like any specific family recipes, but um, just mostly homemade and then growing our own food and that kind of stuff. Sort of, if that counts. Yeah, yeah. Um, Alyssa and Chris, you're welcome to be, uh, you know, to just listen, but you're also welcome to share if you'd like. Well, I'm in the German boat. Uh, um, lots of nephla, sauerkraut, casseroles. Um, and then my dad does live on the southeast coast. Um, so just culturally, um, you know, they do grits, which isn't really big up here. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> and then uh, like okra, you know, that's not very popular up here. They're just different dishes that they make um, uh, regionally than they do up here. Yeah. Hi, I'm back. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, Finnish, grew up in a very Finnish family. Um, my grandma and grandpa both spoke fluent Finnish. Um, so we grew up with uh, what we always called squeaky cheese, but it's, uh, I think the Finnish term is poya line and lepa used though. And um, my mom made uh, like cardamom bread. It was a sweet Finnish bread. Um, yeah, she always made that. And that's known as pula. And uh, yeah, I mean, just all the different Finnish foods, you know, but very Scandinavian, very bland. Um, <laughs> You know, black pepper was spicy, so. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank, thank you everyone for sharing. Um, so Clara offered to share her experience participating in the movement to um, the, as a line three water protector. And um, so I sent you all a reading about uh, treaty rights and line three. And, and central to that issue is the right to hunt, fish, gather, and travel in their traditional and accustomed homelands. And that um, wild rice is central to their culture. Um, so that's why I wanted you all to start thinking about that idea of food cultures and food identities. Um, so Clara, would, 
uh, are you ready? Shall, shall I just turn the floor over to you? You're still I'm gonna unmute and then I'm going to share my screen. Oh, can you? Um... I will make you a co host so you Thank can you. share your screen. Um, while you're doing that, I can introduce myself. I think the interns know me, but there's some other people here. Um, my name is Claire Derby. I live in um, on Ochete Shakowin territory, otherwise known as Fargo, North Dakota. Um, I'm going to school to be an environmental lawyer. I'm starting to go to school in like a couple of weeks. And then I um, have been part of the Line 3 Pipeline Resistance since January. Um, so, and also when I talk about these things, just to want to make it clear that um, uh, I, I'm not an indigenous person. I don't um, pretend to like speak for them or over them. Um, everything that I know I have been taught. And so I just try and share it in a way that is good and humble. And I want to just acknowledge that um, this, is, this has been taught to me. So I'm going to do my best to teach it to you. This isn't me having any divine knowledge of anything. So, and then this is just a presentation I, uh, me and my friend put together a while back. I'm just gonna go through parts of it quickly. We won't do the whole thing. Yeah. So just some background on just like, what is line three? You guys might've heard it about it in the news. Um, there's been like mass arrests out in Minnesota. We've done a couple actions here in Fargo. Um, so, Line three is an oil pipeline owned by Enbridge Energy Company, which is a Canadian multinational, multi-billion energy company. Um, they say that it is a replacement project. The original product, line three was built in the 60s. And so they want to replace the pipeline with a new one for the sake of safety. Um, but as you can see, the section of it that goes through Minnesota cuts a new line and otherwise untouched land in the Anishinaabe territory in Minnesota. Goes through about 200 new um, water bodies, so rivers, wet lakes, wetlands, etc. Um, and it also expands the pipeline. It's about going to about double the carrying capacity, and. The old line, they're just going to abandon. They're just going to leave it, and it's going to become the responsibility of the landowners to clean up. So that's the basics of what the pipeline is. This is a bit of a close-up of where. So the pipeline is completely finished up and through Minnesota, and they started construction on the Minnesota section in November of 2020, after about seven or eight years of legal proceedings. Um, this has been challenged through the courts. Um, and then in last fall, the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission kind of forced through the permits and like kind of jumped through a lot of the processes to get construction started. And now they are like working around the clock to try and get it finished by September of this year. And so the key issue here, um, you can see in this green section, that is land ceded by the Anishinaabe people um, under the 1855 treaty territory. And so what that means is that um, the Anishinaabe people have ceded control of that land to the state of Minnesota while maintaining their inherent rights to hunt, fish, gather, and travel on that land um, without any restrictions. And we talked about the body waters. Okay, before I get into treaty territory, treaty rights, um, just talking a little bit about the type of oil that's going through this pipeline. This isn't your like pure black spouting from oil wells in the cartoons in Texas. Um, the oil is called tar sands oil and it is from the Alberta tar sand pits. And so you can see on the right, it's just total strip mining of this land. The tar sand pits in Alberta are about the size of the state of Florida completely annihilated and it releases all sorts of chemicals. Um, and so like the cancer rates and birth defects and all those things and those surrounding primarily indigenous communities are just through the roof right now. Um, and the actual like texture of the oil, it's kind of like wet concrete and just so much chemicals that we don't know, like, like the, it's not disclosed 
what they put in the oil in order to make it like viscous enough to like throw, flow through the pipelines. And so um, there's just more pictures of the tar sand pits. And so the, because it's so, has so much sediment in it, it just makes the oil very corrosive. And so it just wears through pipes much faster, making the risks of spills that much more. And because all that sedimentation and all is so heavy, it causes the oil to sink to the bottom of any water body it comes in contact with instead of like floating on top to make it like easier to clean up. It just goes down and then just gets turned into, it just soaks into the aquifer. And it's pretty impossible to clean up. And then also all of those chemicals that were put in to allow it to be able to flow, evaporate out in the air. And then the air also becomes very toxic around tar sand oil spills. And then just another note about the oil, a lot of people who are pro pipeline are saying like, we need this to heat our houses and drive our cars and all this stuff. But this, all of this oil is just being exported mainly to China for plastics productions, probably to sell back to America in terms of junk we don't need. And so it's a Canadian company selling oil to China and then putting all of Northern Minnesota's water at risk. It's, it's a bad deal. Um, talked about oil spills. Don't need to go there. Um, uh, line three is the original line three is actually responsible for the largest inland oil spill in U.S. history. It was in 1992 in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. I had never heard of that until about six months ago when I started this fight. Um, it's something that they try to keep under wraps pretty much. And then the oil still isn't totally cleaned up. Like there's still like very visible effects on the land around Grand Rapids. Um, and then just in general, like even without tar sands and just like the risk that that oil in particular carries, all pipelines have a 57% chance of spilling in a 10 year period. So all pipeline spill is what we say. And so putting it through the headwaters of the Mississippi is just, in our opinion, a very undue risk. Um, we don't need to talk about economics. If you have questions on this, I can always go back and deep dive at the end. Okay, let's talk about treaty rights. So um, in theory, what the pipeline should have done was gotten permission from each of these Ojibwe bands to have the pipeline cross their territories. All but one of the bands gave their consent to that. And so six out of the seven bands of, Min in, of Minnesota Ojibwe are suing Enbridge in, to, in violation of their treaty rights. And one of their core arguments, other than that they simply just don't have permission to be on that land, is that the pipeline poses a risk on their right or on their ability of their treaty rights to hunt, gather, fish, et cetera, on their lands. Um, so Article 6 of the US Constitution says that, quote, treaties shall be the supreme law of the land. But they've often, in these fights, we saw this with Dapple, we saw this with Keystone. We've seen this throughout the course of American history. Um, treaties are often broken by the United States government and state governments and are kind of just brushed aside because for so many other reasons, social, economical, uh, Tribes often don't have a lot of political power, and that allows them to be given, to be taken advantage of. Um, and something that really, something that I learned that really helped me frame my understanding of treaty rights and like why this is something that we sh should care about. It's like, I'm not Ojibwe, so treaty rights don't really apply to me. I'm not a tri tribal member, et cetera, et cetera. But someone told me in a way that kind of just like, twisted that paradigm on the, its head is that they told me that we are all treaty people. Everyone living in the United States is subjected to treaty rights. And so essentially what treaties do is give non-Indigenous people basically the right to exist here. Otherwise, we are just squatting and trespassing on the Indigenous land. And treaties just uphold the inherent right of the people who are already here. And so if we are breaking we as non-Indigenous people are breaking treaty rights. We are viol We are putting in question our own right to be here. So that's been helpful for me to think about that and understand like the stakes in this situation. Um, so yeah, that's line three in a nutshell. I can talk about it for about three more hours, but I won't. 
Um, well, instead, let's talk about wild rice a little bit before actually some ongoing things. Um, so they've started drilling under the, um, the water bodies. They use a horizontal drilling technique that kind of bores a hole underneath lakes and rivers and then pulls the pipe um, through it. And in that process, they use what's called drilling mud as a way to just like keep everything cool and lubricated. And again, similar with the chemicals put in tar sands, we don't know all of the chemicals that are being put in, um, in this drill mud. And so what can happen and what has happened at least nine times so far that we've known of is called a frack out. So where the drill accidentally hits an aquifer and then that ca somehow causes the drilling mud to seep out into the aquifer. So you can see, so this, if any of you have been to Itasca State Park and like, uh, like walked across the headwaters to the of the Mississippi, this is about like three miles downstream of that. Like this is like literally the headwaters of the longest river in North America. And a couple of days ago, there was a frack out. Um, so this next one is a more of a close up. So it's just this really toxic mud that kind of just seeps into everything and coats things and suffocates animals. And as far as we've seen, they don't really seem to have a good way to pick it up. We've seen push brooms and like giant shop vacs on trucks and on the sites that we've been able to like come back and see how well they've cleaned it up. Like it's still, a, it's still a mess. Like everything is still coated in this stuff. We're waiting on test results. We've sent water samples into some state labs to see what's actually in here, what kind of impact it could have. There, and another point in this is that um, in an attempt, while, while water protectors were attempting to access water through public access land um, areas, the police for a period of time weren't allowing them to access the water. There were no workers present, there was no safety thing. They had full right to go out onto their boats to collect this water, but um, the there's been a really intense police presence in these fights. And there's a huge, they like to say that they're, um, that they're just here to keep the peace and they're not here to take sides, but um, all of the police presence involved in Line 3 protests, all those police are part of it's called the Northern Lights Task Force, which is this coalition of police and sheriffs across all the different counties. And every month they sent invoices of all of the um, time, resources, equipment, et cetera, that they've spent on the Line 3 pipeline protests and then bill it to Enbridge. So Enbridge is paying Minnesota police officers to basically just act as like private security for their pipeline. Anyway, um, and so there's been ongoing resistance since construction started in November. This was a lockdown from a couple of days ago. So people have been going out and locking themselves to workstations, to equipment, to like physically stop construction because um, we were called on the governor, we've called on the president, we've called on all people who have authority to stop this pipeline and they have all remained silent. And so construction continues Backouts are happening, the water is already being contaminated, and so kind of a last resort is to just physically block construction. But we are a food class, so let's talk about something much happier, which is wild rice. Uh, if you live in Minnesota and you're Minnesota, you have definitely have seen this in restaurants and grocery stores. So wild rice is only two, one of two grains um, endemic to North America. It is a type of grass that is grown in cool freshwater lakes. Um, and the way that it is harvested, it's traditionally harvested by hand. And so people go out in their canoes and one person stands in the back and pushes them. And then another person goes and they have these long sticks and then knock all of the seed, the grains into the bottom of the canoe. Um, and like Stephanie was talking about before, wild rice is a, staple and sacred food source of the Anishinaabe people. Um, they say it's a gift from the creator. Their word for it, manumin, means the um, good berry, I think. And the Anishinaabe people are originally from more of like the Northeast side of North America. And then 
immigrated to like the Minnesota, Wisconsin region about 500 years ago. And part of that story is that there was a prophecy from the creator to say that they needed to travel west until they found the place where the food grows on the water. And so when you see really beautiful lush wild rice lakes, it's a lake, but you can't tell. It just like looks like this beautiful like grassy plain until you see people out in canoes. Um, if you haven't ever tried it before, I really recommend it. There's so many things you can do with it. Um, so yes, yeah, so like I said, it grows in um, in cool lakes. They like to have be about like one to three feet of water with like kind of like a gentle flow with um, a lot of like mucky mud bottom with like a lot of organic matter. And they're kind of finicky plants. So they don't like it when it gets too hot or too cold and they're really sensitive to water levels. They can only grow so high. So if the water is too high, they can't grow very well. If it's too low, they um, just kind of dry up obviously. And, um, and so an ongoing threat to it right now, other than just like these lakes being contaminated with tar sands is that, um, oh, probably about two weeks ago, um, Enbridge asked for a increase in their um, water permits. So like they have to pump out so much water in order to drill under um, the lakes and rivers. And they, were, they paid a $150 fee to put in this new permitting request. And then they increased their um, or initial ask by about 10% or about 100, I can't remember if that goes. Basically they have permission now to pump 500 or 500 billion gallons of water out of Minnesota's lakes and rivers in a time of in, of like insane drought. And so a lot of the traditional wild rice lakes right now um, are just drying up and the rice is gonna, well, people aren't gonna be able to go out and harvest their rice. And it's really unsure whether or not they're going to be able to make a comeback if the water is at the right levels next year. And there's just a lot of uncertainty. So um, do I have anything else more to share with you? I don't think so, oh, there's a chat. Yes, yes, yeah, definitely. If you can purchase rice from um, indigenous sources, I would definitely recommend it. You can buy it in the grocery store. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely support the people who, who bring it to us. So um, to kind of like bring this all full circle and like thinking about food sovereignty and indigenous sovereignty, um, I don't know how many of you read the article about the um, the food deserts in the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota and how it's like 80 miles to the nearest grocery store. And like these, all these like really good programs of like teaching people to garden and like kind of start producing their own food. The thing that I always harp on is um, to always think who is the actor and what is the broader context in these examples of disparity. Um, and so to me, when I was reading that article, I was really struck by how tragically and bizarre it is that people feel like they have to go to Lakota people and teach them how to create food on land that they have been living on since time immemorial. And like, why, how did we reach this point where the people indigenous to this land are struggling to create food from it? Um, and the answer is, is that genocide and cultural erasure. It's been a very intentional project that has led to um, all these systems of poverty and food inequality. So um, food and land has been very central to the settler colonial project of containing and eliminating the indigenous people of North America. So um, like you go think back to like those pictures where it's just like thousands of bison skulls piled up and like the hunters with their rifles. And the story we were told in elementary school is that the bison were killed because their tongues were considered a delicacy in Europe. But the reality was, and like this has been documented in US Army um, records is that it was a very intentional system of taking away a cultural symbol and an important food source of the Dakota people. And basically trying to just like wipe out an entire species to starve out an entire people. And then of course, these once 
indigenous people were in a point where they can no longer resist and like so we are being subjected to being put on reservations those reservations were often in land that was incredibly arid and difficult to cultivate and did not have access to a lot of their traditional food sources and then up until I'm trying to remember what when the American religious Indian religious freedom act I think it was 1978 so it was in 1978 and up until that time it was illegal for Native Americans to practice their traditions and teach their children their cultures and practice their religions and so a lot of this knowledge has unfortunately been lost there's so many stories of resistance where people continue to practice in secrecy and continue to try to preserve their language and teach their children and carry on these traditions and these life ways. Um, but then of course, a one way that we that, that the American government tried to stop even that was by removing the children. We've had all these stories of children's bodies being found at these residential schools. These schools were such that children would be taken away and then have their like the point was like to, I, I'm quoting, have the Indian beat out of these children. So they were punished for speaking their language and taken away from the home. So they didn't even have the opportunity to learn these things. And so all of this, this pipeline, pro, this pipeline project being built in the face of treaty rights and indigenous sovereignty and the right of people to decide what happens on their own land is existing in this much larger context of cultural appropriation, genocide and it's important for me as someone who descends from settler colonials and definitely continues to benefit off of their stolen land to step up and say that that's not okay and that's unacceptable and to fight back against it. So I'm gonna stop there. And I, I don't know if we have time for questions or if I've gone over, so. Thank you so much, Clara. Um, I think you did a great job of putting everything in context and sh sharing the some of the historical backdrop to to how we got to where we are today. Um, <clears throat> I would like to have some discussion, but I also want to um, be considerate of uh, Alyssa and Chris's time. So why don't we spend um, the last 10 minutes in discussion and move on to Alyssa and Chris. Here, all right. Uh, Alyssa here, and there's Chris. Um, so I started Exit 44, Flowers and More, this year, um, how I got here. Um, my husband and I moved out to our farm about six years ago. It was completely overgrown. Um, there was a man in his 80s who was an alcoholic uh, that owned the property. He literally just had a couch and a TV and an ashtray in here um didn't do any yard work so our first couple of years was just cleaning and finding what this property had to offer um i discovered that we have several perennial flowers on the property as well as raspberry bushes and grapevines i'm really a little heartbroken this year the late frost um killed my grapes so I will not have any grapes this year. Um, but, you know, we were finding all of these things. And then uh, we started uh, looking into ways that we could build up this property. You know, we want to make this like our retirement project, essentially. And so we had reached out to um, the Soil Conservation Society, and we've got tons of trees. We dug probably about 200 holes and planted many um, evergreens and maple trees to build up our um, shelter belt and provide um, space for the birds and wildlife that are around here. I always say I'm like, we are a migratory location at my house. Um, the birds in the spring are crazy. Uh, you walk out the door and it, it's very loud. Uh, you can hear them with, you know, the windows and doors shut. 
uh, just sitting here. And so we decided, we were, well, they're here. Let's make them, you know, more of a habitat. Um, so we started doing that. And then uh, my husband and I got married um, three years ago. And I decided I was going to grow the flowers for that wedding. Um, so I was working full time, planning a wedding and growing the flowers for the wedding. And I was like, well, if this doesn't work, I'll just hit up the supermarket and get some baby's breath, call it a day. Um, at least I tried. Um, I had done all of my research of what I needed to do. I knew that there were uh, perennials that were in bloom around the time of the wedding. So I was kind of going off of that and I started my seeds indoors, planted them and everything timed out perfect. I couldn't have asked for anything better. Um, I had um, miniature sunflowers in pots that were right at their peak bloom for the day. Um, I discovered weeds are super hardy um, and they grow a foot overnight, I swear. Um, but I'm still able to go through all of that, cut them, cut the flowers and harvest and have a beautiful event. Um, and then I kind of took a year and I was on YouTube uh, looking around uh, at like, what, what can I do here? Um, you know, like I enjoyed growing veggies for myself, but um, I thought that that had been a little tap a tapped market in our area um, and people could do it way better than I could. Uh, so I was going through YouTube and all of a sudden I found a flower farming video and I fell in love. And from there, I looked at my husband and said, I'm gonna do this. I don't know how, but I'm going to. Um, and we had researched, you know, the Red River Market, discovered um, Jen at Family Roots Farm was only uh, three miles away from us. And we had reached out to her and we're like, so we have this idea, but we're not really sure how to get started. What, what do you think? And uh, she had mentioned the farm's internship. And I was like, I need that because I grew up in an apartment building. I had no yard, no garden, no nothing, no ag agriculture experience besides what I had been learning on my own um, from YouTube and gardening books and all of that. So I applied to the internship and I was a little nervous because I was like, I'm 30 years old. I don't know if they'll take me maybe this is more of like a college kid thing and lo and behold i got into the internship and i was placed at jen's farm um which was really convenient uh that three mile drive is way better than 25 miles <laughs> and uh you know i had the internship i was where you guys were a year ago um coming to these zoom meetings going over the topics of, you know, sustainable food practices um, and all of that. And it, it was so eye-opening to me because I was like, there's this whole other world that I just, I'm just getting to know. And uh, from the flower aspect of it, like 80% of flowers that are in the U.S. are imported from South America, which is sad that they have to travel so far and the chemicals that they use to get those flowers here are just very toxic and not healthy um so those were things that i had discovered while doing the internship doing more um research along those lines and then um working with jen was great um she just really showed me a day in a life uh, you know, balancing family and, you know, work and the farm at the same time. And it's a lot to take on. And then especially when you're a woman in this industry, you know, there are societal expectations of you. Um, and Jen, Jen's a, 
a boss, Jen's a boss. <laughs> um, she can drive a trailer and do all these things. And, that, and she'd show me that I could do these things too. And um, from my experience with the internship, I decided I am going to officially start my farm this next year. And during the winter, um, my husband had been talking to one of his friends and told him what we had going on. And he said that he had a couple of friends and introduced me to Chris um, Wilkes with his mushroom production. And then we also have another Chris um, who does woodworking and amazing. Um, and things we met a few times, decided that, you know, we wanted to do this and just kind of collaborated and built this co-op booth um, that we all kind of come together and have each other's backs. If, you know, I don't have enough product, Chris is there to back me up <laughs> or the other Chris is there. Or if they don't have enough product, we, you know, kind of fill in and, uh, I know last week we had an issue where uh, I had to bring a lot more flowers and it had all worked out. Um, I even this year have found another flower farmer in Fargo and I got in touch with her. And this year she is focusing more on florists um, to sell to. So um, I my stuff was a little behind uh, from working a full-time job. I, weeds I'm telling you they grow a foot overnight and uh so I had reached out to her and asked her if she would be willing to sell any of her blooms and now I have developed this connection with her and we're just like rooting for each other um and it's it's really wonderful at the end of the day that's what I've got thank you um I'm gonna sh just show a quick picture of your booth uh from this last market. And Chris, um, tell us about the mushroom production side of this. Do you need to share your screen or anything, Chris? No. Okay. No, I don't think so. Um, yeah, were you saying something just before? I was turning the, the floor over to you, Chris, to, to oh, share okay. about the mushroom side of things. Okay. So, um, yeah, so like Alyssa said, uh, our mutual friend Nick kind of introduced us all, and um, I had messed around with uh, cultivating mushrooms a, a few times, you know, just super small scale, like just for myself, kind of messing around, and um, yeah, I had been looking at, you know, potentially starting my own business or mushroom farm or whatever, and um I don't know, this all kind of came up and I was, you know, hemming and hawing about it. And then I finally one night I was like, yeah, what the hell, you know, I'll just go for it. And yeah, then that was, I don't know, maybe about, I think when I got going on everything, it was about five months before the first market day or so. And little did I know what I was biting off, but <laughs> it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride so far. But, um, yeah, growing mushrooms and then growing mushrooms for market are two totally different things. But uh, just getting up to scale is like the the really tricky part. You know, just figuring everything out, figuring out equipment. I mean, everything has its quirks. You know, trying to iron out all of that. Um, but I initially got going in mushrooms. Um, I actually started growing stuff with uh, tomatoes. That was probably about three, four years ago or so. And I was just fed up with the tomatoes in the grocery store because, I mean, they don't have any flavor and they're, I don't know, they're just boring. So I was like, you know, I got a backyard. Like, I mean, tomatoes are easy. And yeah, I just kind of started there and I didn't know what I was doing. And I, oh, I think at one point I had 150 tomato seedlings because I thought like, you know, hey, I mean, I got these seed packets. They were like three bucks a pop. So whatever, I'll just plant them all and let her buck, you know, see what happens. And uh, yeah, so I wound up with, I think about 50 tomato plants in the ground in the backyard. They all did really well. I mean, I, I think I harvested about 200 pounds of tomatoes that year. And that's in town, like right in Fargo here. And um, 
yeah, and then it was just kind of down the wormhole from there. I really went ham with the gardening last year and uh, same with the mushrooms. I mean, now I'm, I guess I'm going a little crazy with them, but trying to keep it dialed in. Um, I'm growing, uh, let's see, four varieties. I'm working on the fifth right now, three oyster varieties and then lion's mane. And um, actually right now I've got a liquid culture on the stir plate. I'm trying to break up some agar chunks, but uh, yeah, I've got some black reishi that I'm really excited for. Because, uh, well, it's black. I mean, that's cool, right? <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's something for sure. Because it's, um, I think uh, the, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Earth Angel Mushrooms. I think he's out of Illinois, I want to say. He's got a bunch of videos on YouTube that are really, really helpful. But um, I heard him say that, you know, cultivating mushrooms is kind of a, uh, a marriage between science and art and that's definitely true because I mean there are all kinds of little nuances with the mushrooms and with the grow bags and everything else that you you really have to pay attention to I mean contamination can pop up you know just the drop of a hat before you know it you know I mean the whole crop is ruined and you know if you aren't paying attention to just the little tiny things that that can really get you I just well, Alyssa was just talking about, um, yeah, how uh, they had to fill in with some flowers and stuff this last week. And that was actually because I had a, a green mold outbreak in the uh, fruiting room. And I was able to, you know, trace the source of contamination and then really do a deep, deep clean on everything. But yeah, that's that kind of hurts the heart. But unfortunately, it's, you know, just part of the learning curve because it's at some point, you know, it is it's nature, so it's going to happen. And I mean, even on the big commercial farms, you know, it, it happens. And yeah, I mean, it definitely, it's a bummer when it does happen. You have to throw out a lot of stuff, but you know, you just do the best you can with decontaminating everything and start again. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot to it, but it's fun. <laughs> But yeah, so between working 40 hours a week, raising a one and a half year old with my wife and then doing the mushrooms on the side, I'm, I'm a little busy these days. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing, Chris. Um, why don't we spend a few minutes on questions for Chris and Alyssa, and then we'll go back to the discussion about food sovereignty. So um, what questions do you all have? What was the source of the mold outbreak that you found? Ah, so it was, um, I had a couple fans in the grow room or the fruiting chamber and you know, it's super high humidity. Like, I mean, 90% humidity in there. And it, I don't know if it came from the factory or if it developed in the fruiting chamber itself or what, but there was just a little tiny bit of funk on the fan that, you know, I mean, it, really easy to miss but it was pointed right at a couple of the grow bags and so I went back and after I found these little spots of trick on the bags themselves you know then I looked at the fan and I was like you know where did this come from because the bags on the other shelves don't have it you know and then you just kind of have to step back and troubleshoot from there and yep that that fan was the culprit and then because by the time you see it, you know, it's already green, so the spores are already in the air. So they're, it's just already in the room and you gotta, you gotta dump everything and, you know, bleach it or ozone it or, yeah, use like, I mean, I've got some like lab grade decontamination stuff, but yeah, just, I mean, you gotta go nuclear on it to get everything out of there. <laughs> Mad scientist. Yeah, yeah, just about. <laughs> I have so many questions for you. I'm also growing <laughs> mushrooms right now. Oh, tight. Um, uh, so you make your own culture? Or do yeah, you... I've, uh, I've actually got, this is a golden oyster one right here. It's, uh, this is a newer recipe that I tried out. I don't know if you can see that over the camera. You can probably see the agar chunks, but uh, this was inoculated on the 22nd. So 
these are actually doing really, really well right now. But, um, but yeah, I, I found it was the cheapest just to make your own culture, make your own brain spawn. I mean, you know, get the liquid syringes from a reputable source, you know, so that you know it's got like good genetics and that. And then, um, yeah, I usually start on agar, you know, and grow the, the syringes out or grow out cultures on agar just so you can check to make sure that they aren't contaminated because you never want to trust anything that's coming through the mail. I also work at the post office, so. Trust me, you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to trust the post office. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when I was like planning my whole project with this, I, that, the, that part scared me, and I was like, that's, I don't, I mean, I'm just in my apartment, I don't have like an aseptic environment or anything, so oh, I'm like, yeah. oh, that's where the most things can go wrong, so I just like bought like the liquid culture syringes, and then I made my own grain spawn and like went from there. Okay, yeah, and it worked out for you? I got one flush of blue oyster, I think I had contamination on wine cap. And then um, the chestnut I thought was doing well, but it hasn't fruited and it's been, it's been in its growing substrate for quite a while now, so. Okay. Well, and that could be something like, uh, you know, the fresh air exchange or humidity levels. I mean. I feel, yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, it's usually something super simple like that, but I mean, I don't know. You don't know it unless you try it. You know, you gotta right. kind of mess around and fail a bunch of times and then <laughs> eventually you'll figure it out. So tell me a bit about um, like your growing chamber and that kind of stuff. Like did you build it or how, yeah. did, how did you get like an aseptic environment to do that kind of stuff in? Uh, so I'm in my basement right now um, and I, um, I worked at El Debron here in town if you're familiar with yep. it. Um, I, yep I worked over there for almost a year and when I went in there, I mean, I had no idea, you know, like what sterile technique was or, you know, I'd never worked in a lab or anything. And so I had to get, you know, kind of trained in on all of that stuff. And I just learned it, you know, working there. And then when I started really getting into the mushrooms when I was there, I was like, okay, you know, like this is starting to click, you know, the pieces of the puzzle. It's like all this stuff that we're doing over there, a lot of the technique and the procedures and stuff transfer over to this. So it was like, oh, you know, like I, I get it now. And yeah, so like, um, I don't know, I think, I think it really started like probably last fall, I built my flow hood and then um, yeah, I went from there. And then like right now I'm in, so like our house, I guess the previous owners used to rent out the basement. So it's kind of like a little kitchenette sort of area down here. And um, yeah, so I tented off the kitchen area and then just put the flow hood facing so that uh, I get positive pressure in the kitchen, like when it's running. And that helps a lot, you know, as far as keeping it clean and everything. Um, I also, I can show you all my toys. <laughs> Picked up like this crappy old like light that was, uh, I think it came out of an office remodel or something. And I got it for free and I started looking into um, like UVC bulbs and just UVC lights and found out that the, um, the ballast would support the proper wattage and voltage and all that. And yeah, so like apparently you can get UVC bulbs at, you know, like batteries plus or whatever. And so that helps a lot too, you know, cause then in the event of contamination or just to be cleanly and whatever, you know, I can UV the lab, you know, about once a week or so and then just really nuke everything. And same with like the Vircon, you know, I mean, that that's a fungicide, virucide, bactericide. So, I mean, it's not, it's not just like one thing. It's, you know, you kind of got to do all these different things. And, and even at the end of the day, it's still a gamble, you know, I mean, you're hoping for the best, but sometimes contamination happens. Yeah, I pasteurized, so I, I, my growing, I use straw as my substrate okay. and then so I just like pasteurized it in like a giant like stock pot oh, but yep. then like I couldn't figure out how to like get it to it's just like I have like the microwave hood thing and you're supposed to let it drip and that just I couldn't do it so I just like hung it all up in my garage and then one oh, of my yep. friends is working for a mushroom startup and he came over and he was just like so you pasteurized your straw and then are hanging it to dry in your dusty garage and like think that's going to work out. I'm like, I don't know what else you want me to do. But... <laughs> yeah, 
I mean, it might work, you know? I, I don't know. It grew. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, and that's just one of those things where if you're using something like, um, yeah, like the oyster mushrooms that are kind of more aggressive in their colonization, yeah. that, yeah, it's like chances are it'll work. And like, I've never, I've actually never grown with straw. I do the, uh, the master's mix, you know, so like the hardwood fuel pellets and the soy hulls. And that's just what I started on. And I mean, it, it works great. You know, you get like giant first flushes and I recommend it. Straw was free from my farm. So, you know, hey, next time. You go. Right. We have some questions in the chat. Um, uh, Devin was asking to see your growing space and oh, was sure. also wondering if spores can cling to your clothes and hair and how you avoid that. Um, I think, I think they can, but uh, <laughs> um, I guess I haven't had a problem with it because it's all about, uh, you know, it's just about good ventilation, really. Um, so I've got fresh air intake that's filtered through a HEPA filter. So, you know, the air going in is as sterile as it can be. And then um, I've got the exhaust going outside through, well, like an old, uh, I think it was an old dryer vent, you know, that I then hijacked and had to get adapters for and just run the duct work. But yeah, I can show you. I turned the lights on, okay. Yeah, so I was just in the lab there and I mean, you can't, you can't really see it. That's where all the magic happens. Um, I, I think we, we lost you, Chris. I'm, when you um, moved away from the computer, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, so fruiting chamber but it's uh, pretty pretty foggy in there so we had to go turn it off. Can you hear you Chris? Can you hear me? There you go. I think when you're turning the computer around oh you're yeah not speaking into the microphone anymore. Yeah I think the microphone's up top there but okay so this is the the fruiting chamber behind me and I mean you can see the lights but it's 89.1% humidity in there right now and the fogger's running. So that's that's why it's pretty blurry looking. Um, okay. But yeah, I've got about 40 blocks in there right now that are going. Um, they've been in there for a couple days and the, the pink oysters are really fruiting. Um, they're going nuts right now. The lion's mane is, I don't know, it's getting there. It'll be there by Saturday, but it's a little slower. Um, but I actually, I wear a Tyvek suit and then an N95 respirator anytime I'm in there just to protect against any of the spores. And like a vast majority of them are being vented outside, but you know, there's still going to be the residual spores floating around in the air and everything. So you just, it's just another thing, you know, cause it, it protects you as well as protects the mushrooms, you know, from any bacteria or mold spores or anything that you might be carrying on your clothes and, and that. And like I said, I work at the post office and it's pretty, pretty grubby there. So I, I wouldn't trust anything there. <laughs> and then uh, these, these are one of my colonization racks. Um, this is grain spawn up here. And then I got some substrate colonizing. More grain spawn going on. And uh, OK. So. Yeah, it's, <laughs> there's a bit. <laughs> well, thank you so much for giving us a behind the scenes look at your mushroom production and for sharing yeah. your story, Alyssa. Um, it is five o'clock. So um, I think for uh, our homework, um, I'm, since we, we've kind of run out of time to discuss the food sovereignty uh, topic, um, why don't we reflect on that as our homework? And we always have a reflection question each week. Um, last week, we talked about our reflection question was to look around and see where there's food insecurity in your neighborhood, where there's food deserts 
or compare, you know, what, what part of town is food access really easy and what part is not easy. Um, so we also uh, could have discussed that today too. Um, so I'm trying to come up with a different reflection question that's more in line with our topic of indigenous food sovereignty. So, you know, last week we talked about just food access period, having access to fresh, nutritious food, but it's also about, you know, food sovereignty is also about having access to the right foods, foods that are culturally appropriate um, or even spiritually appropriate, um, like the wild rice. So maybe, uh, um, and I'm open to suggestions because last week's question was uh, from Clara and it was a great one, but I'm thinking maybe something about reflect on examples of culturally appropriate foods or foods that are like like wild rice to the white earth band. Um, what are some other examples of indigenous um, cultural foods that that you see uh, in the communities near you. Um, or taking suggestions too. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not loving the way I worded that, but uh, it'll probably come to me like in the 15 minutes after we end class. Um, oh, and before we go, uh, Devin commented that uh, he is interning with Noreen Thomas at Doubting Thomas Farms, and she's also growing mushrooms, and she uses rye grain as her, um, as her media. Yeah, yeah, I've, uh, I've tried rye a couple times, and I found millet to be, I preferred millet. I know other people prefer rye, it's, yeah many different ways to do the same thing. <laughs> Just kind of personal preference when it comes to some of that stuff, but yeah. Yeah, I've, I've definitely heard of that. Well, thanks everybody. Um, check your intern portal for your homework. Um, you've got some readings for next week about, um, one is uh, Farming Well Black, and, and you also have some resources from the Young Farmers Coalition on um, racial justice and farming. Um, what was it? I had some, oh, and some videos from the Land Stewardship Project about um, rural, rural people and racial justice. So take a look at those and check your portal for your reflection question. And I will see you all on Wednesday at the farm tour at Stable Days Youth Ranch. Thanks for sharing everybody.